in the ongoing investigation of a woman who was found chained in a storage container in rural South Carolina. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just How are you, honey? He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here. We have Kayla. Excuse me? In your property. You're saying you didn't lock her up? You didn't put her in the comics box or anything? No, sir. Imagine living next door to a seemingly ordinary guy. It's like I tell you, he, he read the whole encyclopedias. When he was a kid. Only to discover he's hiding a horrifying secret that spans over a decade. Todd Colehep shot Charlie Carver three times in the chest, wrapped him in a blue tarp, put him in the bucket of the tractor, locked me down here, and I've never seen him again. Okay. Dive into the chilling story of Todd Colehep. I love my country. Uh, they can ask all they want. Mm -hmm. You will not find racial material on my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I refer to with my friend called my Aryan. He's a black guy. Mm -hmm. The real estate agent turned serial killer. Some people are retiring from here. And I always wanted to go into real estate. I wish we had met at a different time in a different place. If you ever want to come back and talk to me, I can teach you how to make so much friggin' money. Whose shocking confessions left a town reeling? Walked outside. I want her. I want her outside. I want her outside. I put a four in the back of her head. What gun did you shoot her with? Same one. Welcome to our channel, where we uncover the most bone-chilling true crime stories you've never heard. Forty caliber hollow points. It it didn't hurt. He didn't want to hurt Charlie because he was a bad person. Join us as we piece together the puzzles that haunt our world. Um, you may get a trip to Quantico. Oh, don't tease me. <laughs> If you're fascinated by true crime and the twisted tales of the human psyche, hit that subscribe button and turn on the notification bell. You're just, you're just a really cool guy, man. Stay curious, stay safe, and let's uncover these shadows together. At that range, they should have ran two feet out of the way. They were way too close. Todd Colehep was born on March 7, 1971, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. His parents, William and Regina, separated when Todd was just two years old. After the divorce, Todd barely saw his dad. He grew up with his mom and his stepdad, Carl Kolhep, which is how Todd got his last name. Now about Todd growing up. He was what you'd call a nightmare child. Even as a toddler, his mom struggled with him. It wasn't just the usual tantrums you'd expect from little kids. Todd showed serious aggression from a very young age. He throws sand. And then when he wanted something, he would push him down and go get it. As he got older, he didn't want to hang out with other kids. He didn't make friends and seemed to dislike everyone. The only way he interacted with other children was through violence and anger. Richie. Todd is someone who stays to himself pretty much. He's a loner. In school, he would push kids around, say awful things, and wreck their projects. One time on the school bus, he got mad at a girl sitting next to him. Out of nowhere, he pulled out scissors and stabbed her in the leg. He stabbed her in the leg. Not much. I mean, it didn't go deep. And it wasn't just at school. Todd was a terror in his neighborhood, too. He'd go around picking fights with other kids, and everyone was scared of him. He was hurt. He says, they didn't want me. One time, he killed his own pet goldfish. Todd was throwing a fit because he wanted a gerbil instead of a goldfish. His mom said no, telling him he couldn't have another pet since he already had one. So Todd, in his twisted logic, decided that if he couldn't have two pets, he'd get rid of the one he had. He poured bleach into the goldfish bowl and watched it die. I just let him have it about Cloroxing the, the goldfish. It made him feel powerful. This cruel streak stayed with him throughout his life. His mom and stepdad were at a loss. By the time Todd was nine, things were so bad they sent him to a child behavioral institute in Georgia. He stayed there for about three and a half months, getting treated for his anger. Todd felt like his step-siblings were favored, and he always argued with his stepdad. He felt like an outsider. It was a contentious relationship because of what, everything that was going on around us. So Todd's childhood was pretty messed up when he turned 12. The doorbell rings. His biological dad re-entered the picture. It's his biological father. Todd hadn't seen him since he was two. 
His dad was self-centered, angry, and violent. He spent his life chasing women. But when Todd was 12, his dad suddenly decided he wanted to be part of his life again. Todd was thrilled. He begged his mom to let him live with his dad. His mom tried everything to keep him home, even redoing his bedroom to make it more appealing. He took a claw hammer to all his furniture and tore it up. Todd started threatening his mom. She was so scared she put a lock on her bedroom door at night. In the end, feeling she had no other choice, his mom let him go live with his dad. So, at 12 years old, Todd moves to Arizona to live with his dad. He had been looking forward to this for a long time, dreaming about how great it would be. But, as it turns out, fantasy didn't match reality. Pretty quickly, Todd got fed up with living there. If Todd ever stepped out of line, his dad would give him a beating. And my dad, Mike, yeah. he had to keep control. Yeah. He had to. Yeah. There was no way that man was Show the dominance. There was no way he was coming out of that. However, there was one thing that Todd and his dad bonded over. Weapons. They both loved them. Uh, I mean, dude, there's like 10 or 12 suppressors in there, and I don't know how many, 40 guns? Mm -hmm. 50 guns? Um, I mean, it's kind of like Pokemon. Gotta have them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I would take them, and I would tweak them. Mm -hmm. uh, the SIG MPX became an SBR. The PTR became an SBR. Mm -hmm. The 516 became an SBR. Todd's dad even taught him how to make homemade bombs. Um, not terrorist. I would never do anything against the interests of the United States. Mm -hmm. I love my country. Mm -hmm. I don't like what we do a lot of times. Right. I love my country. Uh, they can ask all they want. Mm -hmm. You will not find racial material on my stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I refer to with my friend called my Aryan. He's a black guy. Mm -hmm. I don't do the white pride, right. power, right. crap. Um, no. Uh, they're not asked about the weapons because they're so extreme. Uh, I just have expensive taste, and I like <clears throat> quality, and I actually know how to operate every single one of them. But uh, they're not going to get the spectacular stories they want. It's 1986, and Todd is just 15 years old. He's developed this intense infatuation with a neighbor girl. He had a crush on her, and he wanted her to be his girlfriend. He keeps approaching her, asking her out, inviting her over to his place, but she turns him down every time. It's crucial to understand that Todd doesn't handle rejection well at all. So, it's November 25th, 1986, and Todd's dad is away on vacation. He left Todd alone for three days. He goes into his dad's bedroom, grabs a 22 caliber handgun, and heads over to the girl's house. Todd lures her out, and as soon as she steps outside, he pulls out the gun and holds it to her head. He forces her to walk with him back to his house. Once they're back at his place, Todd forces the girl into his bedroom. He ties her up with rope puts duct tape over her mouth and fulfills his carnal cravings. Meanwhile, back at the girl's house, her five-year-old brother notices she's missing and calls 911. Todd starts to hear sirens approaching, and begins to panic. He has to decide whether to let the girl live or murder her. Todd warns her that if she tells anyone, he will kill her younger siblings. Todd then walks the girl home. She's completely traumatized by what has happened to her and is torn about whether to tell someone. The police arrived not long after and started questioning her, asking where she had gone. She breaks down and tells them everything. The police rush to Todd's home and find him sitting on the floor, holding a rifle. Todd looks at the officers and asks, how much time am I going to get for this? He drops the weapon and is immediately arrested and taken to the station. In October, 1987, Todd was sent to prison for 15 years. He was only 16 years old. After serving his full sentence, Todd was released in August, 2001. He had spent almost half of his life in prison. In 2006, five years after his release, Todd applied for a real estate license in South Carolina, despite being a registered sex offender. Were you surprised that he was able to get that real estate license, given the fact that he was a sex offender? No, I didn't know it mattered. So, Todd got his real estate license in June 2006 and opened his own business. He sold at least one house a day. He worked hard. 
He seemed to be living a normal life and was respected in his community. What people didn't know was that behind the charm of this real estate agent lay a shocking secret. Back in November 2003, four years before he opened his business, Todd had walked into a motorcycle dealership and brutally gunned down four people in cold blood. So, let's jump back to 2003, about two years after he was released from prison. Todd decides he wants a motorbike. He'd never ridden one before, but he was dead set on getting a powerful bike, something to feed his ego. In April 2003, Todd heads to Superbike Motorsports in Chesney, South Carolina, and drops $9,000 on a Suzuki. Bought a bike from them. I bought a, I bought a motorcycle from them. Um, what kind of motorcycle? It was a Suzuki GSX-R 750. Now, if you know bikes, 750 is not a good beginner's bike. He has a lot of bike. He goes back to the store with his tail between his legs, asking if he can exchange the bike for something more suitable. I had gone back to them uh, a few days prior to being stolen and told them that I was having a hard time riding it, and I was not so sure I had made a wise decision. He wanted to trade in or return the bike altogether. Did you say? I, I thought it was a bad decision. I was trying to see if I could possibly trade it in for a smaller bike <clears throat> or something of that nature. Maybe I just... I don't know how to ride it. And they bear, had, bear with me. No problem. thought it was a bad decision. Mm -hmm. And maybe considered some of that tool. Want, you said something about wanting to trade or something? Either trade it for something smaller, uh, maybe a 600, or get a, uh, um, just walk away from it, get, get out of it. But the staff at the store ridiculed him, poking fun at the idea that he could handle the bike. During one of my times over there, sitting on one of the, I believe it was the manager, the owner's friend. Okay. Um, Kyle's a bit of an asshole. They refused to exchange it, leaving Todd feeling embarrassed. So you let it slide for the time being. Time being. Got mad about it. <clears throat> kept going out there. Why I kept going to the same bike place, I don't really know. But I'd go out there, sit on the bikes, and listen to these two talk shit. Then, three days later, Todd's bike mysteriously disappears. I had it 14 days, and it got stolen from the front of the apartment complex. For some reason, he becomes fixated on the idea that the staff at the store stole it, despite there being no evidence. What happened? Uh, they were... Please understand, this has been many, many years. Um, they proceeded to give me a little on the rude side about uh, my inability to, to, to ride a, that kind of bike. <clears throat> no one ever taught me. So, I mean, I, I did not operate the clutch. The, um, and the possibility of them coming by at some time with the trailer and made by to make up my mind that they, they had dropped it off at the apartment. Okay. So they knew they knew exactly where it was stored because the guy brought it over to me. He becomes consumed by a desire for revenge. You said I made a police report? I did. Actually, the law enforcement officer made fun of me. He informed me that that's, that's, that's a shame it got stolen before I, before I got a chance to write you a ticket. That was the one time I didn't like you guys. So you made a police report? Yes, sir. And then what happened? Then Insurance came out. I lost a $1,000 deposit because that was my deductible. They paid off the bike, and it was never seen again. Or at least nobody bothered to contact me about it. So it's November 2003, and over six months have passed since Todd's bike supposedly got stolen. He's been brewing up his plan for quite some time. In early November, Todd pays another visit to Superbike Motorsports. Say that again. You kept going out there and sitting on the bikes and on the bikes, trying them out, and listening to these two, the owner and 
the manager basically talk trash. Inside the store were four staff members, owner Scott Ponder, his mother and bookkeeper Beverly Guy, service manager Brian Lucas, and mechanic Chris Sherbert. Todd entered the store while other customers were around, showing interest in some bikes. I was sitting on bikes, talking back and forth, and the manager started making some comments about some of my, and I'm, I'm going to have to loosely say because I don't remember the whole thing, but basically, great, now we'll have some more lines and we'll have another one to go pick up. And made some comments about the last one being stolen. But once the customers were gone, things took a dark turn. And doing my best to make sure that the paying customers were not there. Collateral damage is not cool. When he said it, it was obviously he was not talking about the time when I asked him about possibly selling it, it, it was implied that <clears throat> we took your shit. He told a staff member that he was interested in a particular bike and mechanic Chris Sherbert took it to the back to prepare it for sale. I was sitting on a black Kawasaki Katana, 600 I believe, it's a crap bike, but I was sitting on it and... It was a what now? Black Kawasaki Katana, 600. Okay. Uh, told him I would take it. At which point the mechanic took the bike to the back to prep it. That's when Todd pulls out a pair of latex gloves and a Beretta 92 FS 9mm handgun. Bought a Beretta 92 FS. I don't know why I keep telling you FS. Just details. Beretta 92, 92 FS. FS. Uh, nine millimeter. T at the time, those only had ten round mags because they had still had limitation, and the aftermarket pro mags were god awful. So how many? Ma so you had ten, a ten round magazine? Yes, sir. Three of them. Three ten round magazines. Mm -hmm. He makes his way to the back where Chris is and fires two shots at him, killing him instantly. So you pulled out the Beretta, and what happened? Um, shot the mechanic twice. Downward angle. I shot. You can hear the arrogance in his voice. He was he was beneath me. He was down, crashed down on the, this side of the bike. The bike was here. I'm on this side. So I had to lean over the bike and I believe it was two, two yeah, shots. Keep going, brother. It may have been two, it may have been three, but it definitely was two I'm at, a, at a downward angle. You shot them hand twice at a downward angle, maybe twice? Twice, maybe third time. I don't remember. Hearing the gunshots, the other three staff members rushed to the back. Now, what did you say they heard? They had heard the gunshots in the back and were coming this way to figure out what had happened. Todd encounters a 52-year-old mother, Beverly Guy first, and times in the chest, causing her to fall to the ground. And I heard two to three times in the chest. Scott and Brian try to flee. Uh, okay. she, she fell. The... Son and manager, son, the, the owner and the manager ran for the door. They took off. Okay. But Todd sh both in the back before they can reach the door. At that range, they should have ran to me, not away. They were way too close. When I came around that door, it was boom, three people right there. Okay, so then what happened? They ran to the door. They ran to the door. Um, in the process of that, mm -hmm. I emptied, popped a few rounds. I engaged the first, the first people here, at the all three here. Right. At this point, these two ran. Okay. While they were running, mm -hmm. I emptied it and got this guy. Okay. Then proceeded to go, did a reload. Mm -hmm. While this guy was still running, this guy, but I, when I hit him, mm -hmm. he crumpled into the doorway. Okay. When I did my reload, before this guy got out, mm -hmm. I put two in him before he, before, and he actually fell outside. They collapse, mortally wounded. Todd then goes around to each victim, firing one more shot. And as I did, I put one around to each person's forehead. 
In just a matter of minutes, he takes the lives of four innocent people. Did anybody, as they were falling, I mean, did they did they look at you? Did they face you? Did did they say anything to you? Was there any conversation? Don't please whatever. No, sir. With any of this, I don't remember hearing any of that. I, I will tell you that once I engaged, I was engaged. Okay. Later on, he would boast about how quickly he carried out the killings. That was one big building. Yeah. I cleared it in under 30 seconds. You what now? I cleared that building in under 30 seconds. You got a little bit proud. He then calmly walked out of the store and headed home. And then what did you do? Uh, at that point, put the gun on safety and walked outside and got in my car and drove home. Okay. What kind of car were you driving? A 91 Acura Legend, and it was a gray brown color. Okay. Scott, who was 30 at the time, had a small team working with him at his store. His 52 year old mom, Beverly Guy, was one of them. The mom, I was not going for the mom, but she was there at the time, and she was working there, but. She got thrown into it. She wasn't, uh, <clears throat> she wasn't a primary target. His wife, Melissa, had relocated from Arizona to South Carolina to join him. In April, I moved to South Carolina. I gave up my job. That, that was a big deal to me. Um, they tied the knot in January 2002. Melissa mentions that Scott had always dreamed of running his own business. His, his whole life is motorcycles. They wanted to start a family, but something was wrong. Melissa was not getting pregnant, so they went to see a doctor. He actually had a low sperm count, and the doctor felt like it might be from motorcycle riding. Then in November 2003, Melissa found out she was pregnant. I was in my brother's bathroom, took a pregnancy test, and was screaming in there because I'd never seen a positive one, and so... The day Scott died, he left home early before Melissa. When Melissa left for work, she passed by the Superbike Motorsport, where she saw Scott standing outside the shop. I honked, and that was the last time I saw him alive. After those terrible murders, when detectives arrived, they were baffled. There was no evidence left behind, no DNA, nothing. The only thing they could gather was that this attack was personal. It wasn't a botched robbery because nothing was missing from the store. There was even a briefcase with $10,000 still sitting there. There was money... Big, the, the guy had like 10 grand in cash and a gun in the, in the office, but I would have taken it. Around 3 p.m., Melissa got a call from a worried colleague who had heard about the shooting at the bike shop. She rushed across town immediately. You know, 12 to 15 law enforcement vehicles sitting there. There were helicopters flying above. Before she could get close to the crime scene, police officers escorted Melissa home. She was instructed to not watch TV or any news as they stayed with her, as they waited for further instructions. The news was already telling everybody that there was four victims at Superbike. I knew nothing. I didn't even know that yet. After waiting two hours, Melissa saw the Spartanburg County coroner van in her driveway. The coroners finally did come. They sat her down and gave her the bad news. You know, something very unfortunate happened down at your husband's business today. Um, he was shot and killed. Melissa broke down. Investigators grappled with identifying suspects in what seemed like a senseless assault. Seven months later, in June 2004, Melissa welcomed a baby boy weighing 10 pounds and named him Scott Jr. I had back in front of me and I could, I could actually hold a, a piece, a, an actual real life piece of his dad. The investigation into the Superbike Motorsports killings kept puzzling authorities. Nothing had been stolen and there were no witnesses to the crime. But then, in late 2004, the police had an unexpected suspect in their sights. Police received a tip from a member of the public claiming that Scott Ponder, Melissa's husband, couldn't have kids. And that was a, you know, that was a lead for them. And I'll be honest, that's partially true. When they heard this, they found it odd because Scott did have a child with his wife. So, they decided to take a DNA sample from Scott's child 
and compare it to Scott Ponder's DNA. Surprisingly, they discovered that it didn't match Scott's DNA, but instead matched another employee from the store who was also killed, the manager, Brian Lucas. Thinking not even a little bit that I was involved in this, I instead was thinking, oh my gosh, I got the wrong sperm. In one instance, Melissa became the prime suspect, but she knew Brian Lucas could never be the father. She never had an affair. She wanted her name cleared. I was actually on my way to have his body exhumed. Finally, the sheriff's office called informing her that the DNA samples of Scott and Lucas were mislabeled. I was accused of being involved in having a baby that wasn't my husband. The mix-up was resolved and the sheriff's office publicly apologized to Melissa. The sheriff's department ended up apologizing to me on the news. It's staggering how quickly suspicion fell on Melissa in the aftermath of the shooting tragedy. Authorities pointed fingers accusing her of being entangled in a love affair with Brian Lucas, the victim. Yet, she was innocent. The mistake in labeling blood vials led to a false match. Imagine, amidst the grief of losing her husband, she endured the loneliness of pregnancy and childbirth, raising their child alone. Then, shockingly, the police knocked on her door, casting blame upon her, igniting further pain. Meanwhile, Todd, despite his outward success as a prominent real estate agent, couldn't quell the darkness within. He had everything going for him. Todd was a very smart guy. It's like I tell you, he, he read the whole encyclopedias. When he was a kid. Yeah. He wasn't the same loner, awkward kid. As a grown-up, he had impeccable interpersonal skills. I'm going to retire from here. And I always wanted to go into real estate. I wish we had met at a different time in a different place. If you ever want to come back and talk to me, I can teach you how to make so much friggin' money. Right. He was intelligent and hardworking. He made a lot of money. Hell, I made 160 k in the stock market in five months. Really? Yeah. You're just, you're just a really cool guy, man. By 2014, in his 40s, with immense financial success, Todd still grappled with a sense of deep unhappiness. His girlfriend wanted to take a break, and a growing hostility enveloped him especially noticeable in his demeanor at work. Todd's mind began to dwell on evil plans. Acquiring a vast expanse of land, Todd embarked on fortifying it into a fortress, investing heavily in security measures like cameras and fencing. He stocked up on provisions, convinced of an impending apocalypse. Uh, I mean, dude, there's like 10 or 12 suppressors in there, and I don't know how many, 40 guns, mm -hmm. 50 guns? Um, I mean, it's kind of like Pokemon. Gotta have them all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then I would take them and I would tweak them. Mm -hmm. uh, the SIG MPX became an SBR. The PTR became an SBR. Mm -hmm. The 516 became an SBR. Mm -hmm. um, anything that was rifle wise either got refined and polished and upgraded to for distance, mm -hmm. and everything short got upgraded. For dependability and fire control. In 2015, Todd's evil plans were already in motion. He had been meticulously laying the groundwork for some time, and now his secluded facility was ready. All he needed now was his first target. Todd frequented a local Waffle House restaurant where his behavior was deeply unsettling. He would make lewd and inappropriate remarks to the female staff, creating an uncomfortable atmosphere. It was at this very restaurant where Todd found his first victim. Her name was Megan Coxey, a 26-year-old woman trying to navigate life alongside her 29-year-old husband, Johnny Coxey. I met her there. Okay. Got her number. We talked on the phone for a brief moment. Okay. Then I met them later on at that... Um, Next to Ricky's Hot Dogs, a big, huge parking lot, they walked across okay. and spoke to me there. Okay. Um, I almost thought she was going to hit on me to actually, come on, I should have been in our car. Um, but that's not what I was there for. I got you. I'm going to tell you, our meeting looked shady as shit. The couple facing tough times after recent stints in jail were desperately trying to rebuild their lives and support their young child. The next day, she was in the paper, mug shots. I guess you guys had arrested her for um, meth or some shit, uh, 
her, I don't know, something was in her bloodstream and you took her kids away. Okay. Um, I asked her about it and she informed me that yeah, she had drug issues and with that. Okay. In a cunning ploy to lure Megan to his secluded property, Todd deceitfully offered her employment, claiming he needed maintenance work done on his premises. Desperate for income, Megan and Johnny accepted Todd's offer. So, on December 22, 2015, Megan and Johnny Coxey showed up at Todd's place, but it didn't go well. And I picked them up, and I drove them to my land of kid supplies, mm -hmm. and got them down to my building, and that's when Johnny pulled a knife out, mm -hmm. and you shot. I shot. Todd said it was self-defense because he thought they were trying to rob him. Todd shot Johnny twice right in the chest, and poor Megan saw it all happen. What did she do when you shot Johnny? What did she do when Johnny pulled the knife out? What did she say? Nothing. So you think she was planning on the planning of this? I think she entirely was in the plan of it. Okay. There was, there was no... Oh, shit. Yeah. Uh, Johnny, what are you doing? There was mm -hmm. none of that. This was... Her actions were... She knew he was doing that. Mm-hmm. They saw a guy who had a shitload of money, drove mm -hmm. a car they can't afford, mm -hmm. they didn't have a car, and they were going to get something. Okay. Um, so then you shot him how many times? Shot him twice. Okay. In the chest. Okay. He dropped forward. Mm -hmm. He dropped forward. I went around him and put another one through a spinal column. Okay, and you shot her? Not exactly. After that, Todd didn't let Megan get away. He handcuffed her, put shackles on her legs, and then shot Johnny one more time, just to make it worse. Okay. The girl that was with Johnny, did you shoot her? Not at that time. Okay, what happened with her? She panicked, but then she sat, I told her to sit down. She sat down. Mm -hmm. uh, went ahead and cuffed her, mm -hmm. patted her down, mm -hmm. told her I wasn't going to hurt her. Mm -hmm. uh, she calmed down, mm -hmm. and I actually took her to the Connex. No, that's not true. I had her lay there for a while. I didn't know what the hell to do with her. Um, I didn't want her in my connex because I had stuff in there. I didn't know what the hell to do with it. Mm -hmm. Putting her in with my guns is not a good move. No, I understand that. Uh, I actually had to go... For the first time I ever had a little bit of a panic of what the hell do I do with her. Mm -hmm. uh, put her here, put her there, drop her. What the hell do I do? Do I call the cops? Oh, shit. I got legal guns. Uh, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Uh, what do I do with her? Mm-hmm. Um, she was bad shit crazy, man. No, that's what you said earlier. Uh, I told her I wasn't going to touch her, wasn't going to rape her, wasn't going to do her. Uh, just calm the hell down and let me sort this shit out. Then he dragged Megan to a big shipping container on his property, locked her in, and left her there while he buried Johnny. Megan had to stay trapped in that container for six whole days. It's like something out of a nightmare. I held her there for a couple days. How many days? Five or six. Okay. Um, I every, every other damn day she wanted Little Caesar's Pizza. I hate that shit. Look at me heartburn. Uh, Little Caesar's Pizza, Mountain Dew, not Mountain Dew, Dr Pepper, cinnamon rolls, and freaking Newports. If you go down to my building, you'll find an unused package of Newports that I bought for her. And then he went bad shit. She took. She tried to light my damn building on fire. Do you know how? In the back of what building? The Connex. The Newport pack is still there. The Newport pack is still inside the toolbox. Okay. This is the unused pack. I bought her a. I actually bought her a card. Okay. I didn't. I don't buy. I don't smoke. Right. I don't know how to buy her. I went to the store. I said, okay, I need a thing of uh, Newports, Reds, where the hell they were. The lady went, do you want a pack or a card? I went, oh shit, I don't freaking know. Um, okay. Give me a freaking card. Uh, got her that, got her a lighter. He claimed she tried to burn down the shipping container she was in. I didn't know what to do with her, and then she kept burning shit. I come in and also find that she burned her blanket, and she burned this. She's sitting next to 100,000 rounds of ammo. Love of God, please stop burning shit. Mm -hmm. If that thing goes off, do you know what? Do you know what that would do to a neighborhood or an area? That's not a neighborhood. It wouldn't. It would be, yeah. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, please do not catch the building on fire. She kept 
trying to get shit on fire. And then go, oh, I'm smoking. I'd open the door and then a cloud would come out. It's like one of those cartoons. Looking back, giving her cigarettes, might have been a mistake. He even tried to get rid of her by paying her money to run away to another state. You don't have shit. And last time I could check from what was online, she had a warrant when they were looking for her ass. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll give you the warrant for $4,000. I'll drive you up to damn Tennessee. I'll drop your ass off somewhere. If you got any common sense on this planet, you'll go left and I'll go right. What'd she say? Oh, she got so excited. So after keeping Megan locked up for six days, Todd reached his breaking point. He claimed Megan wasn't cooperating, so on Christmas Day of 2015, he let her out of that container and and killed her too. She went from, I'm so freaking happy in the world to be, I'm going to go to Tennessee with money and I'm going to restart my life and thank you, thank you, thank you, mm -hmm. to betcha crazy. Uh, so I'm just a minute. I got you. At that point, I tried to walk her out of the building. I just had enough. I walked outside. I was trying to calm down. Trying to figure out what the hell to do with her, what to do with her, what to do with her. I didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, I came back in the building. Um, she was going nuts. Just, it wasn't like she was emotional about the situation. This, this had been days. It wasn't much about that. It was just like serious chemical imbalance shit. And she walked outside. I walked, I walked her outside. I walked her outside. I put a four in the back of her head. What gun did you shoot her with? Same one. Did you shot? Mm -hmm. Johnny. Johnny with? Mm -hmm. Then he buried her right next to her husband, Johnny. This happened 12 years after that awful mass shooting at the Superbike shop. Todd just keeps adding to his dark list. Megan and Johnny's friends and family did report them missing, but the cops didn't take it too seriously at first. Megan and Johnny had just gotten out of jail, and they moved around a lot. The cops figured they were just off somewhere. So, in August of 2016, just eight months after Megan and Johnny's murder, Todd decides to invite another couple over to do some work on his property. This time, it's 30-year-old Kayla Brown and her boyfriend, 32-year-old Charlie Carver. Kayla and Charlie had only been dating for about a month, but they were already super close. Charlie had a good job, and things were going well for them. Interestingly, Kayla already knew Todd from before. Kayla, how do you know Todd Colehab? I was introduced to him about five or six years ago by a guy I was dating. Said they were friends. Okay. After that, we stayed in touch through Facebook, and I recently started cleaning houses for him because he does real estate. She'd done some work for him on his property, and there were even some Facebook messages between Kayla and Todd that hinted at a possible past relationship between them. Kayla's dangerous. Kayla has before asked me to beat up people for her or use my resources which she thinks my resources are go get someone killed. Really? Yeah. With people that she doesn't like. A, he have, a have you do or have you hired somebody to do it? Yes. Both? Yes. Okay. Um, I can't read my Facebook. You may be on there. Really? Yes. You know, How long ago was this? You know, I, well, I blocked her after all this shit so that it wouldn't know. Because, I mean, literally... Well, we have her Facebook page. Then you have it. Okay. Uh, it'll take you forever a damn day to go through it. Okay. But go back to the messages. Really? Uh, and her phone messages. She supposedly had money in her car, and the guy took her money, but that's bullshit. And then she wanted me to either use my resources to either have him killed mm -hmm. um, or beat up. I believe he was beat up, but she wanted me to use my resources to have him, have him off or go do it. Kayla uses that thing between her legs to get dumbasses to go do stupid shit. And that's what I'm trying to say, that she's going to use that to get Dustin hurt. So, when Todd asked Kayla to do some work on his property, she didn't think much of it. She trusted him. Kayla told her boyfriend, Charlie, about the job, and he offered to go with her. Little did they know what Todd had planned. On August 31st, 2016, Kayla and Charlie arrived at Todd's property, ready to get to work. Todd was already there, waiting for them. He handed them hedge clippers and started giving them instructions on what needed to be done. But then, out of nowhere, Todd said he needed to grab something from the shipping container. When he came back out, he was holding a gun. 
Before Kayla or Charlie could react, Todd accused them of trying to steal from him. Then he shot Charlie. Terrified, Kayla did as Todd said and went into the shipping container. She had just watched her boyfriend get killed right in front of her. I was completely in shock and I looked down at him and that's when he probably grabbed me from behind, took me inside, put me on the floor and handcuffed me. Once inside, Todd did the same thing to Kayla that he had done to Megan. He handcuffed her, shackled her legs, and gagged her. Then he sat down in a chair and told me that he was sorry about Charlie, but he had to let me know he was serious, that he wouldn't hurt me if I did what he said. Then he told her to wait there while he took care of Charlie's body. He said, I have to go outside and take care of your boyfriend. He left, about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes. And then he said that he had to take care of some things. And when he took me outside, Charlie was wrapped up so, after Todd returned from burying Charlie's body, he did something even more disturbing. He put a dog collar around Kayla's neck and used it to chain her to the wall of the shipping container. She wanted the, 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 the comfort thing that was on the floor? Mm -hmm. That was her idea. That was her submissive kitty bed, her kitten bed. Man, it tripped me out. All of a sudden, I, I put the collar thing on her. And yeah, they found me out. They were like, what? They thought it was for a dog, you know. Well, now the cage that was up there that's in pieces, mm -hmm. that I built, and mm -hmm. it was originally meant for my dogs. Yeah, no, I'm talking about the, the collar, the, the metal collar thing you told me about. That I ordered mm -hmm. off of one of the websites delivered, and I got it because she, she requested that as opposed to me putting the chain around. Mm -hmm. And I got that and went, mm hmm. That would have fucked me up, man. Yeah. Um, I, I went, that ain't going on, nobody. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so it's never been used. Okay. Uh, but she wanted that and then the, the, the kitty bed. And she went this whole thing of ex explaining to me that I had to give her permission to speak to me, mm -hmm. give her permission to look at me. Mm -hmm. Dude, I'll do all that control shit. The conditions in that shipping container were absolutely horrifying. It was dark, damp, and smelled terrible. When I was in the Connex, I had a chain around my neck connected to the wall and a puff around my ankle. Kayla had a metal dog collar around her neck pretty much the whole time. Did you give Kayla cigarettes? Cigarettes, no. She took a shitload of pills. Okay, so did she want cigarettes? She asked me for, for weed. Todd made sure Kayla knew she was in danger. He threatened to kill her if she ever tried to escape. And he didn't stop there. He told Kayla he was a notorious serial killer with hundreds of victims. He said that, not in a lot of detail, but I know he said that he had another serial killer who was just after the guy and the guy actually had been to bring his girlfriend with him. He said the girl didn't know who he was and he was going to let her go in another state, but she pissed him off. So he said that he took her out of the building one day and walked her out the building. Todd even confessed to Kala about the murders of Megan and Johnny, as well as the mass shooting at the bike shop. He also told me that he walked into, a few years back, that he walked into a bike shop at Anderson and shot four people and left, and they never found out who did it. He liked to brag that he was a serial killer and a mass murderer. He said he was going to kill more people because he had dreams of his body count being in three digits. He said right now it was still a high two digits. But perhaps the most twisted thing Todd said was that he was keeping Kayla there because he believed she would eventually fall in love with him. He was convinced she would develop Stockholm Syndrome. It was all part of his sick plan to control her. And, and I told him what you told me. Mm -hmm. He said, I, I said he's, he's made the comment to me, solicitor, he'll plead to everything. Mm -hmm. But he's not pleading right not because he didn't do it right. I said, he told me 
that he's admitted to everything he's done. He's willing to take the responsibility for it, mm -hmm. but he will not take responsibility for the kidnapping. I said, but he will not take responsibility for the rest because he did not. Mm -hmm. The time they had it was consensual. Mm -hmm. She had the choice, and she actually initiated it at times. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. I said, so we're going to need to re-interview her. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and we're setting that up. Yeah, we're going to do that this week. Um, and... I told him, I said, I, I gave him my word that we would re-interview him and I want to re or we want to re-interview her. Mm -hmm. Every single day, twice a day, Kayla was made to do whatever Todd wanted. We would get there between 1 and 3 o'clock every day, take me up to the main building, feed me, make me do whatever he wanted and then he'd put me back in the building. Sometimes he would leave and sometimes he would take the tractor the floor wheeler out. Reinforcing his land, moving boulders and such around fence lines and everything, and that he had to check stuff that he had hidden out there. And then he would always come back between five and seven, take me back up to the boat and beat me again. For 65 days, she was kept in those conditions. She became his means to fulfill his carnal needs multiple times a day. Meanwhile, life for Todd seemed to return to normalcy, with no one suspecting that he was hiding such a horrible secret. The search for Kayla and Charlie stretched on, turning weeks into months. But finally, a breakthrough emerged. The police managed to track down Kayla's cell phone, which had pinged off a nearby tower near Todd's property, the last known location. With this vital clue in hand, the authorities obtained a search warrant and began closing in on Todd's property. Time was running out for Todd. On November 3rd, 2016, two months after the disappearance of Charlie Carver and Kayla Brown, the police were ready to confront Todd. Um, we have a search warrant, okay? okay? For your residence and your car, okay? okay? We are mainly looking for your cell phone, okay? okay well, what I need, I need to go in with, we, we, I, me, <coughs> at least one other, me or, and at least him need to go in with you. So um, that we can get the phone, um, and um, it's, it's standard protocol. Okay. He resisted a bit, but quickly gave up. Do you have other computers in the house? Uh, yeah, I've got computers for days. Uh, Why don't we step inside so we can share in your business out here? Robert, call out. <laughs> Once inside, the detective restrained him. Minimize and, you know, I need all you that stuff. This is just, this is for our protection. As much as you always do, you have to turn around put your hands back. You need an extra set? Uh, well, uh, yeah, give me an extra set. We'll do two so we don't. You're not under arrest. Okay. I'm also in handcuffs. Now for 32. I'll explain it to you in a minute. Plenty of room. I can get my thumb in. Okay. I think I-13 is taking forward. care of that. Have a seat. Let's go ahead and sit right there. What Todd doesn't know was while detectives were questioning him inside the house, a team armed with a search warrant and K-9 units was going through his property where they discovered a shipping container. Inside, Kayla Brown was calling for help. Watch out. Y'all move. I got it. Watch out, boss. Back up. Hey, Joey. 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 Sheriff's office. Sheriff's office. office. Need what? Grab that Back up there, buddy. Are you okay? Grab what? Go. Do you have any weapons? Coming through, okay? What's your name? What's your name? Right here. Lauren. Lauren. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just a girl. Just How are you, honey? This is, bolt cutters. This, is, this is our investigator. He's a paramedic. Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to get you out of there, okay? Just hang loose for me. Anybody got a, I need a handcuff key. Handcuff key. I don't I have got a right here. Hold up. Y'all slide back. Hold on. He's, He's got, got a light. Get pictures. We got to let him get pictures. pictures. Randy, let, okay. let me see your light, Randy. You can, you can put your hands down. You're okay. We're here, okay? Y'all sit back. Please. Please. Light on or off? You're fine. 
we'll get the rest of it here. Let's get her out of here. Come We're on. getting bolt cutters, honey. Don't, don't. Right. You got pictures of the cuffs? No, hold on. Just the wall up here. Okay. All right. All right, we're gonna get you out some okay? You got a handcuff here. I got um, one's in my car. I got another one's in my car. Gloves on when I did that, but don't. Bolt cutter. Little big deal. Just hit, hit the. Do you know where your buddy is? Charlie? Yes. He shot him. He shot him? He shot Who him. did? Who sh Locked me down here and I never seen him again. Okay. He says he's dead and buried. He says there's several bodies dead and buried out here. And okay. he says that the dogs will be ruined if they go looking because there's red pepper. Right. We're going to step you out, sweet dog, because there's what? Red pepper. Okay. Okay. Tell the dog people that. With remarkable composure, she revealed to investigators that her boyfriend had been killed and Todd was the one who had shot him. The news was swiftly radioed to other officers present at Todd's home. It was then detective came in and brought Todd up to speed. He was in real trouble. All right, this is where we're at, Mr. Collett. While we were here, all right, my sergeant served a search warrant on your property. Okay. okay? We have Kayla. Excuse me? We have Kayla in your property. She was locked in a container, okay? She has told us that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so at this time, I'm gonna need you to stand up and put your hands behind he's, your back. He's already killed. Okay, you're under arrest right now for kidnapping. All right, they're continued to search your property. They're gonna continue to bring, they got cadaver dogs down there, okay? okay. Do you wanna help yourself and tell me where the body's at so we can go recover Charlie's body? No, sir. You don't want to? No, sir. Okay. Why'd you shoot him? I didn't shoot anybody, sir. Okay, why'd you lock her in a container in your property? I don't stop her. She's on your property right now, locked in a container. They just got her out of a, like a, um, they called it a specific Shipping name. Conics box. Conics box. So she never left your property. Okay. Okay, you locked her in the Conics box, and she has told investigators that you shot and killed Charlie. Okay, so I'm trying to give you an opportunity to help yourself and help us, help you find this body. Because Charlie, she's saying Charlie's body, you buried Charlie's mm -hmm. body on that property. No, sir. I'm going to need an attorney. Um, probably a good thing. Go ahead and put him in the back of your car. Still maintaining his innocence, Todd told officers he needed an attorney. Todd Kolhep was finally arrested on the kidnapping charge. Authorities kept on searching for the bodies, and eventually, they found Charlie Carver. We did find a, a, a body in a, in a shallow grave. Later, the bodies of Johnny and Megan Coxie were found near each other. Todd had shot all three of them and buried them in shallow graves. In the process of trying to get that uh, person removed from here. Todd faced charges for three murders and the abduction of Kayla Brown. However, the murderer was about to make a confession that had been 13 years in the making, shocking the investigators who had spent so long trying to solve this gruesome crime. In November 2016, 45-year-old Todd Kolhep was finally charged with the murders of three individuals in Woodruff, South Carolina. On May 26, 2017, Todd Kolhep received seven life sentences, one for each of his victims along with an extra 60 years for kidnapping Kayla Brown. Since his incarceration, Todd has written letters to journalists hinting that there may have been other victims in the 12-year gap between the Superbike killings and the Woodruff murders. Yes, there is more than seven. I tried to tell investigators and I did tell FBI. However, authorities have still not found any credibility in those claims. Todd Kolhep loves the attention, and it's the attention he has not been able to gather behind bars. The arrest and conviction of Todd Kolhep marked the end of a dark chapter for the community of Spartanburg, South Carolina. Over the years, Todd had managed to hide his crimes behind a facade of normalcy, successfully evading justice for over a decade. His crimes, ranging from the brutal murders at Superbike Motorsports to the kidnapping and murder of Megan and Johnny Coxey, as well as the imprisonment of Kayla Brown, shocked the nation and left a lasting impact on the victims' families and the community.
The breakthrough in the case came when law enforcement utilized modern technology to trace Kayla Brown's cell phone to Todd's property, leading to her rescue and the uncovering of his secrets. Todd's eventual confessions revealed the depth of his evil, and the justice system responded with swift and severe punishment, ensuring he would never harm another soul again. Thank you for joining us. If you found this story as captivating and shocking as we did, make sure to hit that like button and share this video with others who might be interested. Don't forget to subscribe for more deep dives into the world's most mysterious cases. Tap the notification bell so you never miss an episode. Stay curious, stay safe, and remember, the shadows can't hide forever when we shine a light on the truth.